Welcome to our webinar today. We're sure glad you could join us. We're excited to have a lot of people interested in the information we're going to share with you today. We've got some good information. Uh, a couple of things before we get started. Uh, some of these items will help enhance your webinar experience today. If you have any questions, we have a question box. You can just enter your question in the question box and we'll get to it at the Q&A that we're going to have at the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, additionally, you'd like to know that this webinar is being recorded and we're going to have recordings available on our website and via email if you want to share them with your friends or interested parties or just view it again yourself. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Chris Byrne. I'm going to host this webinar today. Tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I joined our team here in 1988. And uh, that was in May of 1988, and it's May of 2021. And here I am starting my 34th year. It's been an exciting and long career, and I've had a lot of interesting uh, job titles and, and really great experiences and challenges. Uh, when I started, I was an aquatic technician, and I soon became uh, assigned as a regional service manager. And I did that for like 20 years, a very challenging job. And then I segued into business development and focused specifically on aeration and fountains, which is our topic today. Uh, a lot of what I did throughout my career was dealing with customers and customer relationships, but I had a lot of experiences that I look forward to sharing with you guys. And I look forward to sharing the experiences of our team with you too today. Uh, unfortunately, our team is a little short today. Uh, Todd is not going to be available. He wasn't feeling well and in the interest of safety, we wanted to make sure that uh, he, he uh, took care of himself today. He will be available uh, afterwards later on for any consultations, and uh, we hope he gets well soon. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Patrick Goodwin. He's, he's uh, from Vertex Aquatic Solutions. He's an aquatic resource specialist, a scientist. He's got a Master of Science degree from the State University of New York College at Oneonta. He's nationally recognized authority on sustainable lake, rec lake restoration technologies, including nutrient remediation, water quality improvement, lake aeration design, and cyanobacteria management. Patrick is the former president and current director of the Florida Lake Management so Society's Northeast chapter. He's also currently serving as a director for Region 4 of the National or the North American Lake Management Society. Uh, he's widely viewed as one of this industry's top experts, and you'll be hearing from him soon. So uh, we've got a great webinar planned. Let's go ahead and get started. I'll review the agenda for you first. Uh, we want you to have a clear perspective on uh, during the seminar, so we'll review these topics quickly. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about oxygen. We're going to talk about low oxygen water quality issues. What is dissolved oxygen? Why is dissolved oxygen important? Uh, this information is going to show uh, the importance of dissolved oxygen as a factor in the water quality in your water bodies. And that's kind of an underlying theme of our program today. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the tools that can help increase the dissolved oxygen in your ponds. Uh, we'll be talking about how fountains and aerators work and what the benefits of fountains and aerators are. And then Patrick's gonna get on and he's gonna to talk to us about oxygen saturation technology. And he's got some very interesting brand new technology there. You're gonna to wanna to hear everything he has to say. So as you can see, we have a lot of information for you. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about some of the water quality issues that are due to low dissolved oxygen. Uh, the release of noxious gases and metals from the bottom uh, sediment are one of the problems. Uh, fish kills, they're always unfortunate. They're always usually oxygen related. Um, increased phosphorus levels, which can fuel noxious algae growth is an issue. Uh, another one is increased hydrogen sulfide levels, which can cause foul odors. Uh, none of these things are very pleasant and you wanna to try to control them whenever you can. Uh, another one is a loss of water storage volume. Uh, our ponds can uh, get shallower as accumulation of bottom sediments build up on the pond bottom, and that can 
cause problems with uh, retention and so forth. Um, so the, the oxygen gets into the water a couple of different ways. One of the main mechanisms, natural mechanisms for dissolved oxygen getting into the water is the interaction between the surface of your lake and the atmosphere. And wind can help that. Uh, the more uh, interaction there is, the more dissolved oxygen is going to be absorbed by the surface of your water body. Another way your water body gets oxygen is through the photosynthetic processes that are being done by the plant material beneath and at the surface. Uh, that photosynthesis has a byproduct of dissolved oxygen, and that helps recharge the water in your pond with dissolved oxygen. So since we know water quality issues are usually related to dissolved oxygen, to low dissolved oxygen, and we know restoring a water body once it has water quality issues can be costly, we recommend that you be as proactive as possible. You want to review all the sustainable solutions, and we're going to do that now. We'll talk about fountains and aeration. So fountains and aeration. Fountains and aeration are two common tools used for dissolved oxygen. Uh, for dissolved oxygen no, improvement in your water quality. They are both two different kinds of tools. They work differently. Um, one of them is going to be more effective than the other. And we'll go ahead and review some of those right now. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the fountains and aeration systems and how they work. This is a great graphic here that shows you the two systems. Uh, a floating fountain is going to draw water in at a pump intake that's located beneath the float near the surface of the water. It's going to launch the water into the sky. The water is going to fall back on the pond surface and you're going to get a little circulation like you see in that image there. Uh, and then the bottom aerator is going to be releasing a column of bubbles at the bottom of the pond and rising to the surface and entraining water from the bottom of the pond and carrying it to the surface so it can react with the atmosphere also and increase its dissolved oxygen levels. Uh, so you can see the uh, flotation, the, the flow patterns and, and the difference between the two. Uh, aeration is going to release dissolved oxygen through the entire water column. Um, it's going to destratify the pond. It's going to increase the dissolved oxygen levels deeper. And so you can kind of see the difference between the two. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, floating fountains. Uh, floating fountains are ideal for shallower water bodies. Uh, they come in two different uh, physical forms. Uh, they have horizontally mounted fountains and vertically mounted fountains. Uh, basically, there's a flotation assembly and suspended beneath that is a pump and motor assembly with an intake screen. That can be mounted vertically where the intake is actually a little deeper, uh, farther from the surface, or it can be mounted horizontally. Uh, where the intake is actually closer to the surface. Uh, there's advantages to, to both. Uh, they both draw from different depths. Uh, the one that's, uh, the horizontal one can be a little easier to clean because the, the intake screen is closer to the surface. Uh, the vertical one is going to draw water from deeper, so that's usually a little better. Um, you want to make sure you pick the right one for the right location. Uh, if you don't, you can have clogging issues or uh, you can you can actually have the water get stirred up a little too much if it's too close to the bottom. Uh, however, uh, when you do pick the right one, you'll see that fountains are going to increase the DO in your lake and they're gonna help release uh, some of the gases. As that water hits the uh, waters, the surface of the pond, it injects dissolved oxygen and it actually causes some bad uh, gases that are trapped in the water surface to go ahead and get released. So some of the benefits of uh, fountains include that they can mitigate nutrient loading impacts. They don't do it quite as effectively as an aeration system or uh, they're basically going to just introduce the dissolved oxygen to the surface water. Uh, they're going to provide increased aesthetics. That's something that uh, an aeration system doesn't really do. Uh, the surface of a pond is generally a nice blank area. It makes a great canvas for uh, a centerpiece. And so fountains are often utilized as a focal point. Uh, they can uh, display a variety of patterns. 
and they have all kinds of lighting options available today. The new technology with LED lights is just astounding. Uh, they can uh, have choreographed color programs to change colors. They can get them to uh, choreograph to music. They can get them to sync with holiday color schemes. So technology is going a long way and, and fountains can really be a great focal point. In, in addition to uh, being a visual focal point, having a fountain in your pond can actually provide a benefit of white noise. Uh, a lot of times in communities, multifamily communities, where there's a lot of living units wrapped around a pond, uh, having a, a device in the pond that's creating a white soothing sound is going to interfere with some of the, the noise that could come across the pond from other units like uh, dogs barking and loud conversation. So, so those are some of the uh, benefits of, of a fountain. Uh, they come in all sizes. Uh, you could have a fractional horsepower. You can go up to 60 horsepower. Uh, this one in the view here looks like it might be a seven and a half horsepower. Spectacular tri-tier there. Um, whatever size you choose, uh, you got to you got to make sure you size it right for your pond. If it's too big, it can it can stir up uh, the bottom and cause issues. If it's too small, the impact is going to be limited. Um, so let's talk a little bit about submerged aeration systems. Uh, submerged aeration systems are much more efficient than fountains. Generally, they're going to operate at a lower horsepower. Uh, a one horsepower compressor mounted on the shore is going to be able to circulate more water than a five horsepower fountain out in the middle of the pond. Uh, so, so they're efficient because they're lower horsepower, but mostly they're efficiently because of the way the technology works. You start with a shore mounted compressor and it pushes air through self-weighted tubing to diffusers located around the bottom of the pond. Uh, those, those diffusers release bubble columns that rise to the surface from the very bottom of the pond. And those bubble columns lift huge volumes of water. Uh, there's really nothing more efficient than taking something as light as air and putting it down at the bottom of the pond so that it does the lifting of all the heavy water. These systems are usually sized to lift the entire volume of the lake every day, uh, which a fountain could probably never do. And these systems are lifting water from the very bottom where the water quality can have its worst issues. Uh, so they're, almost, they're often sized for turning over a pond once per day, lifting the entire volume. They can do more than that. Uh, and they do carry the low dissolved oxygen water to the surface where it gets to interact with the atmosphere and recharge its dissolved oxygen levels. Some of the benefits of submerged aeration systems are, um, are low, really illustrated well in this slide. If you look at this picture, you'll see that it's a cross section of a pond and the water's forming layers. The bottom layer is a darker blue. And you can see that it's got challenges with the uh, oxygen, uh, muck accumulation, uh, that bottom bluer layer is going to be cooler than the top layer of the pond, and therefore it's going to be denser. So in a lot of ponds, they're just not going to want to mix, and it's going to stay, but bottom denser water is going to stay down there, and all its oxygen is going to go away. Uh, so, so you want to recognize those layers and the fact that the water at the bottom is deeper. In some ponds, stratification is, is normal. Some of the big lakes up north, that's normal. But in a lot of other ponds, retention ponds especially, this slide shows you the problems that can develop with that. Um, they can have uh, a lot of water quality issues. So the aeration system, uh, the rising bubble columns are going to mix the layers. They're going to eliminate the stratification that was shown at the beginning of this slide. And now you can see the cross section where the water is properly mixing. Uh, that's, that's going to increase the oxygen levels at near the bottom. That's going to allow for nutrients to get oxidized, they're going to bind up with some of the normally occurring minerals in the pond in the presence of the new oxygen. And, and those nutrients are not going to be as available to feed algae blooms, which oftentimes can become repetitive and continuous blooming and dying and releasing the, nu the nutrients and blooming them again. So, so this is a, a good water quality tool. It also improves water clarity. And for those of you folks that have water bodies that are subject to freezing, this is a, a great tool to keep uh, portions of the surface open for wildlife access or for fishing 
or to keep uh, ice away from areas where it could be a safety issue. Um, this aeration system is working good. The slide you see, it shows it's a fairly deep pond. It's not so ideal for shallow ponds. The shallower the pond, uh, the less effective uh, an aeration system is going to be. So it must be properly sized. Uh, if it's in too shallow pond, it's not going to work so well. If it's not the right size, you could have some other problems. Uh, the bad water you're lifting out of that lower level could mix with the whole pond and cause other problems. So definitely want to make sure you size it right. Uh, in addition, uh, I want to point out that uh, these, this aeration technology now comes solar powered. And uh, it's really a neat technology. I described a moment ago how we have this clever mechanism of letting the air do all the heavy lifting. When you stand on a lake bank next to a solar powered pond aerator and you listen to the little humming cabinet and you look out and you see these boils of water that the sun's energy is lifting off the bottom, millions of gallons worth. It's just, it's just really cool technology to see. I always get a kick out of it. And speaking of really cool technology, we're gonna have uh, Patrick start talking to you a little bit about his oxygen saturation technology. So Patrick. Thank you, Chris. And thank you everyone for joining today. So oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. We've heard that word quite a bit today and it serves it right because if you think about it, it's the active ingredient behind the bubble. And the more oxygen you have in your water, there's a direct relationship between oxygen concentration and water quality, and more particularly in lakes and natural lakes and ponds, it's the concentration of oxygen for the sediments. And so I'm really excited to be able to introduce a new tool that we have in our toolbox to be able to manage oxygen or really manage water quality via adding oxygen directly. And this new technology is it's uh, it's oxygen saturation technology, which is actually based off of side stream saturation, which was uh, the first successful unit was installed back in 2014 by Dr. Ganser, um, probably one of the smartest people I know. And from there, uh, what has happened since that first installation, um, we have taken it and taken a lot of the engineering costs out of it and made it to a commercially available system. And this system allows us to be much more precise and targeted and being able to maintain whatever desired oxygen level we still want, and, and more importantly, be able to maintain the oxygen where we want it, right over the sediments. And so to kind of show you how this new technology fits into the other strategies, other methods for adding oxygen, um, I can show you uh, this next slide over here. You know, again, oxygen, there's a direct relationship to water quality. As you decrease oxygen levels, especially over the sediments, you're going to see a decline in water quality. And so Chris just described two methods, circulation type methods of being able to add, you know, the active ingredient, oxygen. Um, you know, the, the really the benefit behind the bubble is oxygen. And so, you know, these two circulation type devices, if you have, you know, uh, fountains, they're going to be very localized and be able to provide benefits in that localized area, be able to increase oxygen in that localized area, mostly in the surface. It's not going to be able to get and most often unless you have some type of um, suction hose that goes down to the bottom. You're not going to be able to get the oxygen where you really need it in a lake or pond, which is right above the sediments, right over the sediments. And so there's circulation devices. So, you know, using bubbles as a low cost, energy efficient way to mix water. And that what all aeration does is allows the entire volume of water to be exposed to the atmosphere. So the driving force and the amount of oxygen you have from aeration isn't how much bubbles you have, or the size of the bubbles, it's actually the area that's exposed to the atmosphere and wind speed. And so there's been a lot of data and a lot of research and there's these, uh, there's, we actually have uh, re-aeration calculations now that have been developed over the past 30 years looking at this process. A lot of really smart people put into these models and we can actually now predict and tell how much oxygen we can actually add. And so 
one of the biggest things, again, is the surface area exposed to the atmosphere and wind speed. And when you go from these calculations, what you'll see, if I go from a sustained wind of eight miles per hour down to one mile per hour, you have no oxygen, almost no oxygen being added once you reach you know, about one mile per hour sustained wind. So wind is a major driving force to how much oxygen you're going to have and is why we see so much fluctuation in aeration systems and you're really uh, up against um, the amount you're up and the concentration you're gonna have in the water is really governed by climate, you know, temperature, wind, and area exposed. And so, and that goes for all the circulation type devices. So this new saturation technology, which is, um, allows us to be able to add that oxygen directly to those bottom waters, directly for the sediments at a quantifiable amount. So it allows us to get to levels of oxygen that we have never been able to get to before. And it provides exceptional water quality over circulation uh, type devices because we essentially what we're able to do is the more oxygen you have over the sediments, the further penetration you down you have into the sediments, you drive that oxic anoxic boundary down further, reducing internal loading of metals, phosphorus, amodification, hydrogen sulfide. So as soon as you start getting above eight milligrams per liter, we see a substantial change in water quality and a, almost a complete elimination of internal loading. So these diagrams really kind of show this process where you have you know, surface movement, you still have that thermocline developed in the lake, and we're not really getting it where we need to with the fountain. Circulation, we're exposing the whole volume of water to the atmosphere, and concentrations will increase based off saturation of, of oxygen, you know, just within the atmosphere. And then oxygenation, we can target our oxygen, our, our oxygen delivery just to that bottom water where the source of most of your problems are coming from and allows us to reduce our treatment um, cost because we're not having to treat the whole volume of water, we just have to treat that bottom hypolimnion. And so again, uh, so, so to kind of show you how this system works and the kind of the nuts and bolts behind it, um, essentially what this system is designed for is for lakes that are less than 50 feet. There's a actually, a once you, get, once you have the luxury of depth, you can, Get, you don't actually have to use a pump. You can just pump in with gravity-fed, pure oxygen. You don't have to worry about uh, mixing. This is, uh, uh, again, based off side stream saturation technology. So what we're doing is we're pulling, you know, the cold bottom water out of the lake, super saturating it with oxygen, and then putting that same density water right back in. And you'll see this increase. It's, it's amazing. This high levels of oxygen just sitting and coating the sediments. And so what you're seeing here is the discharged uh, saturated water. So this is uh, what you're looking at is actually 55 milligrams per liter DO being injected back out to this, uh, to this pond. Um, there was a, a lot of research and development that went into this with Dr. Ganser and I. And um, there's, these are some of the key features in, in this new technology where um, uh, the key processes what we actually had to uh, demonstrate and collect data on for our process patent. Um, so there was a lot of things we had to prove out to be able to write that patent and get it out there. So here are some of the things that we actually are, are part of the process patent is that there are no bubbles. There's no bubbles at the discharge because with oxygenation, again, we're not trying to circulate stuff. And the benefit of the bubble, the benefits behind the bubble is oxygen. So if you see a bubble with oxygenation, because this is pure oxygen, that means you're not getting it into solution and it's actually degassing out to the atmosphere. So you're not getting the oxygen into the water. So if you see bubbles with an oxygenation system, that's cost that you're losing, that's, that's inefficiencies in the design. And so you're seeing right here, 55 milligrams per liter, and there's no bubbles uh, going back out. Um, a couple other fe features is that we aren't, we aren't mixing sediments, which is very important for oxygenation. The more mixing and turbulence of sediments um, requires actually more oxygen added and will increase costs. We actually, there's a, it's a process called the induced oxygen man, where, you know, 
aerobic or, or bacteria that are in the sediments, as soon as you add oxygen, they get greedy. They want to add, they want to keep taking the oxygen out. And so if you start mixing sediments, um, what you'll end up doing is having to add more oxygen. So this was another feature in here to, to remake the system more efficient. Uh, we also have a, an energy dissipating header that doesn't allow uh, for clogging, eliminates clogging. And then there's also no disruption of thermal layers or stratification. When I say stratification, I'm talking as small of a temperature difference of 0.5 centigrade. So this also, what this also means is that we can maintain cold bottom water for cool and cold water fisheries and high oxygen. And this is also the first ever ice preserving oxygenation system. So you can now maintain and prevent winter fish kills while also preserving your ice. And you can go out there and do your ice fishing and so forth and still be able to enjoy um, all those recreational uh, um, items. This also, uh, Chris had talked about, you know, shallow waters, aeration starts to become more limited and it's because our area of influence of mixing becomes more and more condensed and localized. This new system allows us now to be able to stay right in that target zone, like one foot off the bottom and just be able to maintain high levels of oxygen all the way through across, just one foot off the bottom, two feet off the bottom. And so what I'll show you now in this um, and demonstrate for you guys is all the, all the testing that had to go into writing this process patent. And the big thing I wanna be able to explain is this process called dispersion. So you probably have heard of the word diffusion, which is the act of actually diffusing a dissolved substance into water. The time it takes that dissolved substance to reach a certain point is called dispersion. And so what I'm showing here, part of this patent was, and um, uh, part of this uh, testing was to show this process of dispersion. So you have this uh, uh, treatment zone, so to speak, and this oxygenated zone over here, and then you have this saddle that goes back up. And one thing that we did here is that we didn't place the headers right on the bottom because we wanted to show that we can maintain all that oxygen right in that layer, that density layer. You know, oxygen goes where density flows and it behaves like any dissolved substance in water that is governed by uh, what we call Brownian in motion. And it's, it's, um, it follows very, very well laterally throughout that density layer. It doesn't move very well up and down through a density layer. And so it's what part of this, what we're showing here is how important it is when you're using this type of technology is to get the oxygen right at that deepest point. And when you're injecting it, it will move through dispersion naturally, which is very energy efficient. There's no, you don't have to mix anything and it will move outward across the entire bottom and get it right where you want it, which is right over the sediments, driving that oxic and oxic boundary even further. And so in this example, what we're doing is you're taking that 55 milligrams per liter of water, which I showed in the last slide, and we're injecting it at the six meter depth in this, in this area. So this entire pond had zero oxygen below two meters. And um, you can see the, the red, you know, the entire bottom of this pond was anoxic. They were starting to have a, a algal bloom, a cyanobacteria bloom that was mainly because of the oxygen. And what we did here is we took that 55 milligrams per liter and injected it at, at uh, about 60 gallons per minute continuously over a, this 30 day period. And what you'll see here is this, and uh, you can't see it right now, but the, the data below, uh, the graphs, what it's showing is this dispersion. So we have this oxygenated zone, which reaches peaks in 30 days, uh, peaks to about 12 and a half milligrams per liter and it goes over the saddle 550 feet away you still have this bulk of oxygen in that density zone so for this look and so that's all just from dispersion as long as you're putting it underneath that um, that thermocline and that right off the bottom that oxygen will just go all the way over and disperse outwards and that's what this uh, you know kind of visualization is and um, showing in these in this data right here, right where that you know six and a half meter uh, injection point, you see that high high level of oxygen. So the 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 method of this is now that we can be much more precise and targeted and be able to put that oxygen right where we want it 
and be able to really address the water quality issues that is coming from the sediments. And all lakes will eventually have oxygen loss at some point in their life. It's a natural process of lake aging as organics start to come in and start to deposit. That is actually what is the source of oxygen loss in all lakes is from the sediments. It's, and it's a test that we do, it's called sediment oxygen demand. It's not BOD or COD, that's water column oxygen demand that's for wastewater. Sediments are the driving force in natural lakes and ponds for oxygen loss and water quality decline. And so this is a, a new tool, the first ever tool that allows us to be able to target our oxygen. And we can maintain as much, we can maintain at 10 feet, 50 milligrams per liter if you so want. Although I wouldn't suggest it. I would just, if you're managing for ecology and, and natural conditions, oxygen in nature in lakes will be from zero all the way up to about 15 milligrams per liter based off temperature and salinity. So we, when we do these installations and we install these systems, we try to make it so that you're within eight to 15 milligrams per liter, which is naturally going to occur in your lake already. So the one of the first systems that we installed, which was back in April, uh, was it out in uh, Sarah, it's Sarah's Pond, it's up in Massachusetts. And what we're, uh, what was the original design for was done by Dr. Ken Wagner, and he had called out for eight to 12 kilograms per day. Um, we had, uh, this is just one of our standard systems. It was able to deliver 97% of the uh, oxygen delivery. So we were able to get about 17.5 kilograms per day if they wanted to add that. Um, we ended up turning the system on and in 24 hours, we had 30 milligrams per liter coated in this bottom four and a half meters. Everything below four and a half meters, you can see on the data in the graph is 30 milligrams per liter coated on the bottom. So that was a little bit too much oxygen. So what we were able to do and, and what, why it's so important to collect a little bit of data after you install these systems for any system to make sure it's properly working but also it will save you money. And this is a great example where we were able to now calibrate the system for the lake and turn it on a timer. So instead of it operating 24 hours a day, it's only operating six hours a day. It, their electrical costs went from $12 a day to $3. So the electrical cost to operate this system for six months is about $500. And so you can see the installation here, and the saturation chambers with a bubble capturing system, which takes out nitrogen. There's a lot more science that goes behind this. Um, but the, what I wanna show you is this ener energy dissipating header. So this header, and this is the suction and discharge being laid out and it's being placed right at the bottom, right on the bottom of the lake. And that's where that, you know, we're sucking the same cold water and dense water and laying it back out. And so with that, I'll let um, hand it back over to Chris and have him talk about, um, you know, the different types of ways we can design these systems. Hey, Patrick, that's really uh, incredibly exciting technology there. Thanks for sharing it with us. So um, we've talked about fountains and aeration and oxygen saturation technology. We need to think a little bit about determining what the, the right system is for your water body. Each one of these technologies we've discussed, um, regardless of whether it's the fountain or the aeration or the oxygen saturation technology, it's very important, and Patrick touched on this really well, it's very important that the equipment is properly sized and properly placed. Uh, additionally, we need to understand that each of these technologies has their set of limitations. And that if we don't understand those and work with them clearly, we're not going to be successful improving the oxygen levels in our pond. Uh, some examples of the limitations, uh, I mentioned fountains earlier. Uh, fountains are not going to circulate uh, deeper water. If you put a fountain in a deeper pond, it's not going to have much of a bottom, uh, an impact on those bottom layers of water that we showed you in the cross section earlier. Uh, conversely, uh, an aeration system that's placed in a shallow pond isn't going to be as effective at lifting the water. Even though those uh, bubbles can lift huge volumes of water, uh, the trip they take from the bottom to the surface, the shorter that trip those bubbles take is, those bubbles take, uh, the less water they're going to lift. So, so there's limitations that need to be considered. There's sizing that needs to be considered. 
and uh, there's placement is, is also very important. So um, uh, another important factor here are exactly what type of water quality issues are you experiencing? That's probably one of the main factors to consider when determining what system you need to use. Uh, additional to those water quality issues, those specific ones, uh, you, you want to consider the pond shape, the pond size, the pond depth, and uh, the overall water volume. All of those are important also. Uh, bathymetry is a very good tool to help uh, determine where to place your equipment. Uh, it's the mapping of the pond bottom. And you saw some images in Patrick's presentation where they actually showed the, the pond bottom imaging. Uh, so uh, with that being said, uh, there's another important factor I'd like to talk about, and that is ongoing annual management. Um, uh, this is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, if you take it seriously, uh, it's going to help limit the water quality issues you have. Uh, because your water body is out there in the open, in the open environment, and, and because there are variables that you may not even know about, much less be able to control, uh, you have to you have to use every tool you can, and you have to use them properly. Um, they and these additionally to that factor, the water quality tools themselves uh, have the limitations I spoke about. They also require attention and maintenance. Uh, if they're going to be working properly, uh, they need to be maintained. And and when they're properly maintained, they're going to extend the longevity of the equipment. They're going to improve the efficacy of what they're trying to do. So those factors make it uh, very important. It's an important practice to have an ongoing annual maintenance program. If you look at the slide here, you'll see there's a lot of options with ongoing annual maintenance programs. Um, they, they, uh, they, take a, they help you improve your water quality issues. Uh, they protect your investment. Uh, they can also enhance the efficacy of other water quality improvement tools like nutrient remediation, beneficial bacteria, buffer management, and water quality testing. Uh, establishing a management plan will determine what other safe sol solutions might be required down the road. And uh, so with that being said, uh, I think we're ready now to get started with some questions and answers. Um, before we do, I want to let you know that we need your input on our feedback survey and would also like to um, let you uh, use our online poll if you want to uh, try to say uh, an online consultation set up there. You can just click on that right there. So uh, while you're looking at that, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, uh, you do the survey or take this poll, you might be the lucky winner, one participant is going to receive a solid bag, bag with lots of goodies in it. Everybody uh, likes those. All right, should we get started now with the questions and answers? Uh, I've got a good one here. This is from in Florida. Jackie asks, what is the cost of a fountain aeration system? Well, I can answer you, Jackie. I can tell you that each water body is different. Each water body is gonna have different water quality issues. So there's no real average price. Uh, the variables like power locations and tubing lengths can swing your cost either way, regardless of the acreage of the pond. Uh, so, so you're going to want to consult an aeration specialist. Let's see, we've got another question here from Mary in Connecticut. Mary's asking, what are some preventative measures in addition to aeration that will help minimize, if not eliminate, algae blooms especially cyanobacteria. So I'll take this question. Uh, Mary, I, I want to tell you that one of the first things you want to do is look at the uh, basin, the drainage basin that feeds your pond, and look at the best management practices that are being done by the landscapers. You want to make sure they're doing the right thing with their grass clippings. You want to make sure they're doing uh, best management practices with their fertilizer. Now, that's a big important thing because everything that's done in the basin around the pond is going to affect the pond. So hopefully that answers your question, Mary. Randall here is from Pennsylvania. He's asking, what are the benefits of aeration or oxygenation saturation technology 
in terms of growing big bass? Well, we all like big fish. Patrick, maybe you can answer this question. Um, so all fish, all aquatic life needs oxygen. It's vital for their growth and development in all stages of their life. And so the, the more, again, the, the more oxygen you have and the better, your, the better your water quality is, um, the better you can uh, be able to uh, grow your fish and be able to actually have more, more fish as well too. If you can manage your water quality properly, you can have more fish, bigger bass, and uh, not have to have any risks of fish kills and stunted uh, populations and so forth. Okay, Patrick, that's a great answer. Um, what do we got here next? Oh, uh, so Richard from Delaware is asking, when do you know that additional aeration is required? And how do you determine the size and number of aeration devices required? So Richard, I got the same answer for both questions. It's water quality testing. Uh, the water quality testing, the water quality data and depth information that you can get with that testing is what you need to properly size a system. If you're collecting water quality information on a water body with an existing system, you want to make sure that system is operating properly. You wouldn't want to get a whole set of data that looks like there's a problem and then find out that problem is that your equipment wasn't operating properly. And I'll, I'll add to that. So for aeration, uh, again, you, just like Chris said, testing the water, um, be able to get a temperature profile all the way down from surface to the bottom at different intervals. What you're looking for, for aeration, again, is, is we're trying to mix the entire volume of water and expose it to the atmosphere. So what you're looking for for an aeration to ensure that it's sized properly is a temperature difference from the surface to the bottom of close to zero. So that ensures that we have sized the system properly and that the entire volume of water is actually getting exposed to the atmosphere where wind can actually get the oxygen into solution. So that's that's the quickest way of determining is the system sized well, going out there, doing a profile, temperature profile, and seeing do you have any stratification, you know, during the hotter, you know, hotter months of the year. Well, that's great. Thanks for helping out with that question, Patrick. Uh, that's a lot of good input. Uh, here's another one that you might be able to answer. Uh, Greg from Florida is asking, how do I know my current aeration system is adequate? What testing can be done to discern to determine a properly sized system? Um, I mean, again, going back to the temperature, looking at temperature difference between the surface and bottom, but the easiest way is just looking at it, is to be able to ensure that this the diffusers are in the deepest spot. So again, most lakes issues are coming from the sediments or derived from the sediments. And so if you are, if you have a, a pocket and the diffuser isn't in that deep pocket, you could still have some, some issues. So where you're placing this, the, the diffusers is, is a, a big component of if it's sized right, are you treating the whole volume of water? Are you actually getting that full turnover, which is a, you know, kind of a rule of thumb. And so a bathymetry map goes a long way in making sure the designs are right. And that goes for both aeration and also this new um, saturation technology. Uh, just having a bathymetry map can make your design and, and save you so much money and make it so much more efficient. Okay, thank you. Uh, Donna from New Hampshire is asking, how many aeration systems are needed per acre of water? So Donna, the uh, number of systems required is going to depend. Uh, a single system with a, a shore-mounted cabinet uh, aeration system can circulate up to 20, 20 acres or more. That cabinet can operate multiple, multiple diffusers, and uh, the diffusers per acre can vary depending on several factors. Again, I recommend consulting an aeration specialist. So yes, we, the, the oh, I'll, I'll just add to that. So the, the depth is a big factor. So if you have shallower lakes, you actually need to add more aeration and spread that out, um, which will increase uh, your costs. Um, once you start getting less than 10 feet, you have to start putting a lot of diffusers out to be able to maintain, you know, that atmospheric exchange. But in general, there was, um, it's about 1.3 CFM per surface acre is a good sizing rule of thumb that was developed uh, by Lorenzo Fass back in the, 
uh, the 80s, uh, it was a, a big EPA study that was done. Right, Patrick's correct. That's why I mentioned about those bubble trips that uh, if they're only traveling a short distance to the surface, they're just not going to lift as much water. Okay, here's a good question. Uh, this is from Derek in Florida. Will aeration or oxygen saturation technology help clarify my water? Yes. So again, the more oxygen, the better your water quality. That goes with clarity as well. So it will it will help with all the organics, suspended organics, whether it's algae, detritus, um, all the organic components. Oxygen will have a will be able to oxidize that, reduce nutrients, which are causing the algae. But if it is silt, you know, which in some parts of our our nation, you know, you have a lot of clay and silt and geology background soils it's not gonna have much of an impact. And so um, you, you wanna uh, be careful because if, if you do have lakes that are very high in clay and silt that are, and that's the driving force behind your water clarity issue, you, you probably still have an oxygen issue, fish kills can possibly ha happen. You don't wanna necessarily be mixing. You, this is another area where an oxygenation system would be better suited because we're actually not mixing those layers and stirring up clay and silt that would be coming in. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, here's another question. This one is from Deet in the Georgia. Do fountains or aeration require regular maintenance? So yes, so uh, we recommend maintenance on this, these uh, types of equipment. You wouldn't uh, buy a new car and then just not maintain it. Uh, uh, routine maintenance on these systems will not only increase their longevity and make them last longer, but they're gonna make sure they're operating efficiently. And that's important because your goal is water quality improvement. It's also important because it costs money to operate them. And so you want them to be operating efficiently. Uh, a problem if you choose not to maintain your equipment is that you're going to, you're going to spend more on parts. Parts are going to need replacement and, and that's going to get, uh, get expensive for you. So Dee, I hope that answers your question. Jason C is asking, are there aeration options where no electricity exists? And yes, I can tell you that uh, I mentioned earlier in our webinar that uh, solar powered aerations, and I talked about how cool they are. Uh, there's also wind powered aerations. Now, uh, these are uh, suitable devices that can help you improve your water quality. Uh, they come in handy where there is no electricity. So Jason, if you've got a pond that there's no electricity around, this is what you're gonna wanna consider. If you have a pond with a power supply, it might be more economical to go with the conventional powered equipment. Um, solar is pretty expensive and, and uh, it can get even more expensive on larger ponds. So the ideal site for a solar powered aerator would be a small pond that's very far away from a power supply. Okay, we've got one here from Ken up in British Columbia. Ken's asking, does aeration have an impact on sediment and mucky bottoms? Patrick, you want to answer that one? Yeah, so this also gets back to being able to maintain oxygen over the sediments. The more oxygen you have over the sediments, the more organic decomposition you can um, can have. Um, and so, you know, imagine being able to put, and they, they do this in wastewater as well. They'll, they'll, they'll get oxygen levels up to 50 milligrams per liter, and it will just oxidize the sediments uh, or oxidize suspended sediments. And so it, it is a function of oxygen. Um, if you have, if you don't have oxygen, you're going to have muck build up. It's an anaerobic process. If you've ever seen, you know, or you, you can smell it first, that anaerobic process, because it leads to hydrogen sulfide, a lot of the odor smells. If you smell that, you know you're going to have a lot of organic muck. Um, the back, the byproducts of bacteria are this mucilaginous, and it just continues and continues and continues. If you, as you um, go longer and longer without oxygen. And once you restore oxygen, you know, once you get to about five milligrams per liter, you'll start seeing a consolidation. But the more and more oxygen you have, the more penetration down into the sediment layer. And there's, uh, there's been some cool studies where they put little peepers down into the sediments and measured oxygen penetration at different levels over the sediment in the water. And, you know, the more oxygen you have over the water, you have a more driving force to go down into the sediments and be able to break down more and more material. Okay, that's a great answer, Patrick. Uh, our next question is coming from Virginia. Rod is asking, is there an easy way for a homeowner to test for dissolved oxygen? 
is it possible to have too much dissolved oxygen? So I'll take the first part of that question. Uh, there are some easy surface tests, but they're not going to really bring you very much valuable data. Uh, like Patrick has been saying, it's the oxygen at the bottom of the pond that's important. You could take a surface reading and it would be uh, a nice middle of the road, eight parts per million. And, but it doesn't mean you don't have problems down at the bottom. So you really want to go to the trouble to consult a specialist and, and have a profile done that's going to measure the oxygen from the bottom to the surface. And um, Patrick, you want to answer the second part of that question? Is it possible to have too much dissolved oxygen? You had mentioned some pretty high uh, concentrations there. Yeah, so you can, um, if you have too much oxygen, and you can definitely do that with this system because you have a lot more flexibility and be able to maintain really whatever level, you, we, you can maintain whatever level you want up to, uh, you know, physics of, of pressure. Um, you know, like, for example, at 10 feet, I can get up to like 50 milligrams per liter. If I go above 50 milligrams per liter at 10 foot of pressure, I actually, what will happen is we'll have degassing. And so the oxygen that I put into solution will actually come back out. Um, a great way of uh, conceptualizing this is if you ever open up a soda can, we've super saturated CO2 in that can. And when you open it up, it pressurizes and degasses off. So we've done this and it was part of it was really cool. So you actually will see smoke on the water. It, it literally looks like smoke, this very, very fine smoke coming out. It's just oxygen coming back out of solution. Um, you would want that in wastewater if you're not really managing for ecology and so forth. But in most lakes and ponds where you're trying to, you know, have all the aesthetics and fisheries and so forth, eight to 15 milligrams per liter is your, you know, the target DO that you want to be able to maintain. Okay, thank you for that. Patrick, appreciate your help on that one. Uh, so uh, our next question is from Anthony in California. Is the time of year a determining factor when considering implementing any of these aeration methods? Yeah, so it's much easier to overcome anoxia before it develops. Once anoxia has developed, when I say anoxia, once low oxygen has developed in the bottom waters, it's much harder to overcome that as opposed to preventing it from occurring in the first place. So aeration and this new system will perform better. You don't need to add as much circulation or oxygenation if you can get it started earlier. For, um, there's also some risk if it's already been thermally stratified and you have a large volume of dead water, you have to be very careful with aeration to not just go ahead and turn the system on and just mix all that dead water up. You'll have a fish kill, you'll bring up nutrient you know, laden water and stimulate a massive cyano bloom, which has happened time and time again. I've seen people not knowing what they're doing and undersize the system. For oxygenation, there's really not any risk because we aren't mixing. So it's a, it's a, it, it prevents, it eliminates that risk um, and it allows, but you still have to add a little bit more because you have to counter the demand that's being taken out continuously on a daily rate and then also account for the amount of volume of dead water that's already accumulated. So you have to counter the current demand and then also all the oxygen that's also already there and present. So you have to actually jumpstart it and add more than what you would normally need if you had maintained it in the first place. So that's great. Anthony had a good question there. The seasons are important. Here's one from New Jersey. Heather is asking, what is the best way to aerate a retention basin? So uh, I would answer that by saying that uh, it depends on the size of the retention basin. If it's a small, shallow pond, then, then a fountain might be your best bet. If it's uh, larger and deeper, then, uh, then an aeration system might be your best bet. If it has some uh, mitigating water quality issues, then maybe you'll want to consider the oxygen uh, saturation technology. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, it depends on what your what your goals are for the for the lake, and you know, fountains are will increase property values. There was a paper that came out it was by like thirty percent. Um, and aeration is great if you're for water quality. It's a very low cost, you know, energy efficient way to get you, you know, fair to good water quality. And then obviously OST gets you to a new level that we've never been able to get to, and can address right. certain problems that we've never been able to before. Okay, that's great. Okay, here's a question from Dorian. It's a good question. She says, is permitting required for the installation of fountains and aeration system? 
or the use of oxygen saturation technology. So I would say that uh, it depends on your region uh, and it depends on the scope of the project. If you're installing a fountain or aerator where there's an existing power supply, in some regions, you may not need any permits. If you need a new power supply, you're probably going to need a permit. Patrick, anything to add for oxygen technology? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very state dependent. I know Michigan has a lot of regulations and you have to have a permit for either an aeration or oxygenation. Um, if you, and the threshold is 30 feet. So if you, you actually can't aerate in deeper than 30 feet, um, mainly because they don't want to um, mix up that cold water, which is supporting trout and uh, cold water fisheries. So anything right. more than 30 feet, you're not allowed to mix and you have to actually go with an oxygenation system, which is what this would be. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Here's one from Andrew. Uh, do fountains increase evaporation? If so, would you avoid using them in low humidity climates in drought regions? So I can uh, respond to that. My own perspective is, yeah, there's going to be some evaporation. Uh, there are some fountain display patterns that are going to cause less evaporation than others. Uh, if you are exposed to droughts, and, and if you're in regions where droughts uh, are going to be a challenge, you may want to consider not operating the fountain during drought periods. In fact, there are some regions where uh, the agencies, the municipal agencies, will not allow you to do so. Patrick, I mean that's that's a great question. Um, so the warmer the water, the more the greater your evaporation. Um, and so mixing, yes, yeah, any circulation would, uh, I would say, would have some area. I mean, it it depends on the temperature. If you're if you're warming the water, you will evaporate things more. Yeah. Okay. Here's another one. Kathy is asking, what is considered shallow for a water body that would benefit from a fountain induced aeration? Uh, and how many feet should it be? So uh, we've got uh, some ponds that are pretty small. I've seen ponds that are four feet or less. They're not very large ponds. I've seen a fountain help improve the circulation in, in something like that. Uh, once they get a little over four feet, six feet, eight feet, you might find an aeration system might be a better tool. It's possible that a, um, a pond that's six feet deep or more may have already formed some layers and stratified a little bit. Uh, you really want to consult a, a specialist so that you can make the best possible decision. I'll just say that you know, shallow versus deep. That's a it's a cultural thing. Um, you know, cultural terms. How we define those is it really depends on on who you're talking to, but for these types of strategies, it all depends on the layering of water and where stratification is occurring. You can have four feet of water, two feet of water, and have stratification right off the bottom, you know, six inches, and you can have this, you know, release of, of phosphorus and metals and so forth. So, it, you know, shallow, deep, it's it can still occur. Okay, that's interesting. Here's one for you, Patrick. Jeff is asking, can oxygen saturation technology be used in a water body treated with alum? Uh, yeah, so we're actually doing um, a pilot project right now. So this is, uh, it's called targeted, it's a hybrid system. So one of the beauties, because we are pumping water, uh, this lake in, in North Florida, they have, they're in a failing septic area. It's a eight acre lake and they have this bottom two feet of water that gets this constant load from the septic. So it's 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 very nasty water. Um, it, I almost puked when we were pumping it and treating it. But um, you can use this technology because alum won't restore your oxygen levels. It'll help um, reduce some of your biological oxygen demand, water column oxygen demand, but it's not gonna address your source of oxygen loss in lakes, which is the sediments. So you'll store oxygen loss. So what this new tech you know saturation technology can do is we can now treat both oxygen and um you know source water that's coming in so what we're doing in this pilot project is uh, this is a, a new method of treating groundwater intrusion um using both oxygen and alum and what we're and we're we're, we're essentially able to reduce our treatment volume substantially because it's all we have to do is just treat that bottom two feet of water 
So we're pulling that out, super saturated, you know, getting all that hydrogen sulfide, treating all that ammonification. They don't really have much iron left in their sediments to bind phosphorus. That's why they need uh, help with binders like alum, which is a very low cost uh, way of doing it. We're doing a, a one and a half gallons per day, which is a super low rate of alum, and then putting this really nice clean water back out and just distributing it out over there. So that'll, it'll be a great case study. And um, oxygen and alum are, are great um, 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 synergies. Uh, they, they mix very well and um, they can address, you know, problems that uh, one couldn't and the other could, so. Okay, another good answer, Patrick. Thanks for your help on that. So it looks like we're running out of time. Uh, uh, we've got some more questions and we're going to want to get those out to you by email and our website uh, over the next couple of weeks. Stay tuned and we'll get the answers to any of you who didn't get an answer to your question today. We want to thank you guys for joining us. I want to remind you that uh, uh, we want you to fill out our feedback survey and that you could you know, win the swag bag. We sure hope you enjoyed uh, your time with us today. We appreciate that and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.